Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub as we skip merrily through time like saucer-shaped stones across the still surface of some white sandy southern pond. I am Micah Hanks as always, and joining me are my comrades, James Waldo and Jason Pentrail. Fellas, how are we doing tonight? Doing great, man. I gotta say, I'm really excited for this episode. Why? Do you like archaeology or something? Well, you know, not only that, but once again, we get to show off our new equipment uh, live from the field at White Pond in this case. Yes, we took the Rodecaster Pro out into the field and did a little audio uh, dabbling. In fact, actually, we had a dabbler of sorts right there with us joining us for the weekend. And uh, so more on that a little bit later. But yeah, we were doing some audio dabbling with the Roadcaster Pro, this is a wonderful unit. I'm integrating it into the studio now that I'm back here in the Cross Time Pub. Things are sounding pretty good. Waldo, let's get a quick air check from you. Hey, I'm here. And a good intro, by the way. Very eloquent. <laughs> you know, the the setup we had at White Pond this time, though, that was fun, man. And we had, we had all our gear out. We did all these interviews. Had a great time. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, there's nothing like having a complete audio recording rig set up in a hunting lodge where otherwise you might not even expect to have power. But remarkably, we had that. We even had a security system. And so uh, later in the program on some of the interviews that we will be featuring from that wonderful experience there at the White Pond site, uh, you'll actually hear the door opening and the little chime, (laughs) which was kind of funny. And by the end of the uh, night, there were people guarding the door trying to keep it quiet in there. But we, we had a good time. And uh, I, I think my big takeaway was I know what it's like now to celebrate St. Patty's Day in the presence of archaeological greatness. And by that, I mean Chris Moore, Chris Judge, Chris Young, Chris Cottrell, Chris Corley. Again, every guy that we know involved in archaeology and study of the ancient past named Chris was out in full force. And, of course, Dan Newbanks and many other fine folks who weren't named Chris. So we had a really good time down there. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I actually had an excessively good time, which is what I sometimes like to do. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite moments actually was after that day of recording and everybody's getting kind of hangry and we'd almost crashed our drone in the pond trying to get footage of the water and look for potential sites and all this kind of stuff and get a, a topo layout at the request of Dr. Moore. All these wonderful adventures. And Jason and I at one point escaped. We snuck away to a Mexican restaurant up the road. And that's that moment, Jason, of decompression, you know, yeah. where after a busy day, you just sit down and, oh, God, enchiladas are the best thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, margaritas following after uh, a day of Irish whiskey kind of balanced things out quite nicely. Uh, <laughs> did you have a margarita? I, I sure didn't. <laughs> no, actually, I don't think I did come to think of it. I think it was a good idea, but I don't think I actually pulled the trigger. Next time, my friend. Yeah, there's always next time. Next time. Well, even if you haven't got margaritas, you know, again, the the culinary side of all this is part of what's so fun. But first, we have to recognize uh, a true icon in the field and sadly one that we have lost, a gentleman who had been long associated with the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And we were very sad when we got back to hear about his passing. We're recording this episode in the first week of May. And unfortunately, we've you know just received the news here at the end of April uh, that, in fact, Dennis Stanford, curator of North American archaeology and director of the Paleo Indian program at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution, has indeed passed away uh, in the last part of April there at Georgetown University Hospital after battling a long illness. Dennis was a beloved member of the archaeological community. He was respected by many professionals and amateurs alike, including us here at Seven Ages. 
After receiving his PhD from the University of Wyoming, Dennis joined the Department of Anthropology in 1972, launching a 47-year career at the museum. He became one of the best-known archaeologists in North America with a gift for communicating research to both scholarly and public audiences. At a time when Paleo-Indian archaeology was still in its formative stages, Dennis helped advance the field through his studies of lithic materials, especially the distinctive stone tools known as Clovis points. His early career field work at the Jones Miller Bison Kill Site in Colorado was an exceptionally careful excavation and study of a rich bison butchery site that dated to the Folsom period roughly 10,000 years ago and helped set the stage for the rest of his career. The last few decades of his research focused on the origins of the first inhabitants of North America, along with the human adaptations to the changing environment as the last ice age was ending. He conducted fieldwork in Siberia, northern China, the western Arctic, the Rocky Mountains, and most recently the Chesapeake Bay region. Early on, his experimental research in using traditional stone tools to butcher an elephant that recently died was covered by National Geographic and provided valuable insight on primitive butchering techniques. During his career, Dennis authored 136 publications, including several books, Across Atlantic Ice, which described his theory for an Atlantic route taken by the earliest Americans, was his most recent book. It was translated into multiple languages and was made into an e-book. Dennis was generous in his service to the museum and academic community, serving as chair of the anthropology department from 1993 to 2000, serving as the head of the archaeology division multiple times, hosting 32 fellows, and serving on many dissertation committees. However, his substantial research and service accomplishments are almost outshined by his extraordinary contributions to the archaeological collections. Dennis was the excavator and donor of 20 acquisitions totaling 475,000 objects and was the curator of record when an additional 32 acquisitions joined the collections, representing an additional 673,000 items. He will remain one of the foremost contributors to the North American archaeological collections for decades, if not centuries to come. Yeah, he certainly will. I have good friends, Jim and Carol Reuter. Uh, who are retired and live here in Asheville now, but they knew Dennis. And when they found out about the work that we as a team are doing, they said, you know, there's somebody we know up there at the Smithsonian who would really appreciate you guys. And uh, he's a good friend of ours. And I said, oh, really? Somebody at the Smithsonian we could talk to. And they said, yeah, and his name is Dennis Stanford, which I couldn't believe because I own many of his books. I'd read famously about how he had arranged when this elephant passed away at this zoo to be able to, for lack of a better term, have the body donated to science so that they could understand the different varieties of flaking technologies used in the ancient world and how they would be used to butcher the remains of megafauna. There is no other way, quite simply, than to actually put that into practice, which Dennis Stanford did. He was forward thinking in many more ways, uh, so many in fact that there's too much to cover right now. All I want to say is, again, he was truly an innovator. And I think everyone that we have met in the work that we do in this field, guys, speaks so very highly of Dennis Stanford, and he is truly a great loss to this field. I don't think it'll ever be the same without him. So uh, we remember him fondly on this edition of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Uh, I don't think there's much more that really needs to be said uh, for this intro segment, since we've got an awful lot of interviews to get to in the next segment, although I don't think we could go much further without mentioning our good man, Dan Newbanks. Uh, He was somebody that we met, and actually you'll be hearing from him in one of the interview segments a little later because we caught up with him on the microphone along with our good friend and avocationalist Chris Corley. Uh, But Dan sent along $20 uh, to further our efforts, and a quick note, he said, a round of Guinness on me, boys, so thank you, Dan, we appreciate it. We hope to be able to bring you a Guinness next time we head down your way. And uh, yeah, it was a great time meeting Dan and getting to hang out with everybody down there at the White Pond Dig. Why don't we talk very briefly, by the way, before we get into the interviews about what the White Pond Dig is all about, why we were there, what we were doing there, and what we learned. It's a multifaceted uh, project. I mean, there's a lot of things going on there, not only looking for the archaeology itself. Uh, there's there's testing for uh, impact proxies. There's uh, an incredible amount of information that's locked up in that pond uh, because of the age of the pond at over 30,000 years. So it really is a time capsule and there's so many things that can be learned at the white pond site. So we are always excited to be there. This was our second time. Uh, Every time we have one of these opportunities, we certainly want to take it. And white pond is truly a unique site. Even for this part of the world, uh, white pond is really, I mean, it's really just a jewel because these really ancient lakes, 
don't form or don't last in this part of the world like they do up in uh, you know up in up Wisconsin and Michigan and some places that have a, more of a glacial terrain. So naturally formed lakes and ponds like that, if you can find them. They're great sites for this type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other things that's you know interesting and always educative in terms of what we're doing there is, of course, being able to work with experienced professionals. There are a lot of volunteers, but you know, participating in the actual dig. And in fact, the very final morning of the dig, and there are certain things about the dig because research is ongoing, of course, that we won't talk about. Uh, Dr. Chris Moore, who oversees this dig, very graciously sat down with us for a segment on the microphone that you'll be hearing in mere moments. But again, with all the things that are going on down there at the site, we of course want to allow uh, an actual site report to be written. We want the peer review process to be able to be seen through uh, with any additional information forthcoming uh, on down the road. And so there will be new updates and information about White Pond uh, to come. But of course, there's certain things that we won't be able to talk about entirely right here. Now, that's how much is going on. It's a very dynamic dig site right now. A lot of different things, as you said, Jason, that are being looked at right now, and a lot of different elements to be considered in relation to you know, how people interacted with their environment in the ancient world. But I will say this. The Seven Ages team had a very proud moment because in one of the excavation pits, we were all taking our turns doing the actual sifting of the sand, you know, the shoveling, um, and further proof that Jason Pintrail is indeed a lithic detector of some sort. Uh, as soon as I put down the shovel, he says, would you like for me to relieve you? And I said, sure. And I go grab the camera so that I can do what I'm normally doing on the site, which is documenting with you know, video and audio. And uh, Jason takes up the shovel and almost immediately uncovers a hunk of quartz that we suspect to have been a preform. And so I run back over there with my camera. Jason's on hand. James is right there. Dr. Moore comes up. He's confirming what we found. And I'm able to get the camera. I mean, really just tight right on it as Chris is looking at what we have and it was just this profound moment of archaeology well in the moment you know dan was there chris was there everybody was on hand and we had this great moment of oh cool we've actually found something you know the seven ages team right there assisting on the site and we're at the epicenter of that and that is one of those unforgettable experiences uh, you know and you learn so much it's our own field school the only thing is is that there isn't any kind of accredited university <laughs> or anything associated with that with all the time we spend in the field I almost wish you know, some of that could go toward the furtherance of an archaeological education. But whether or not we're paying for it in that regard, we are learning. And that's what this is all about. And I'm just thrilled always to be able to have that experience together with you guys in the field. So, fellas, what do you say we actually share some of this experience with the listeners and get to these interviews with these fine folks down there who assisted with the dig over the weekend? It's about that time. It is indeed. And so leading the charge will be Dr. Chris Moore, who has overseen the dig site there at White Pond for numerous dig seasons. When we return right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Speaking for myself, when we got started in Southeastern Archaeology, there was one name that continued to appear, and you would see his name listed uh, not only as the co-author, but often the lead author of a lot of papers, and that was Christopher Moore, and he is really, I think, the quintessential Southeastern Archaeologist, arguably one of my favorite, and also the fellow who has probably been the kindest to us <laughs> in the field. I mean, in fact, he is sitting, pointing case, right here with us and talking about the latest paper published in Scientific right. Reports. And this is going to be, I think, a game changer because we're looking at further evidence that is supporting the idea of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Chris, how are you doing? Doing great, man. Really good. It's always good to be here with you. You're so gracious. You have us out there on the site. You got us down in the dirt digging. You know, I don't know if all the other people who uh, contribute to the dig sites that you work, thank you profusely. <laughs> You're welcome. Appreciate the help. We appreciate you having us here. But Absolutely. again, this is the first interview you uh, will have given since this was published. Absolutely. What are yeah. we seeing in this latest paper? I mean, I think most people are familiar with the YDB impact theory. We'll get more into that, but let's talk about this new paper. Right. Well, this is a paper from South America. It's a site where they've got, you know, really incredible megafauna remains lithic artifacts 
We got the Platinum Anomaly. Really incredible sight. It's kind of like a lineup. I mean, it's like the all-star lineup, right? Because when we're talking about the YDB, right? I mean, this is something that is still a little controversial, and hence, you know, we yeah. want to represent it really well. But again, the accumulation of data, and for me, the game changer was the Platinum Anomaly. Right. This was a paper that you were the lead author on in Nature. Right. Right. Well, actually, it was published, I think, in what scientific reports. It's the same journal, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, I mean, what we're seeing is an indisputable evidence of something. I mean, what is that platinum layer? What does that actually represent, and why is that so important? It's really representing a, a really a geologically instantaneous atmospheric input of platinum, platinum or platinum-rich dust. I mean, it doesn't just come often on Earth. I mean, a rare Earth element we're talking about. Right. So when you see a lot of platinum, right. what, is, what, what kind of thing does that usually indicate? It gets your attention. Certainly the, the, the impact scientists, you know, when they were looking in the Greenland ice core, when they were looking for iridium and found platinum, and that really got their attention because that's not something you see naturally elevated mm-hmm. in any sedimentary or even ice sequences naturally. Yeah. You kind of became known as the guy. For the platinum anomaly, I, mean, I think that's well. Certainly, say. right. Certainly, after the original Patel et al. paper for Greenland, yeah, and that's really the one that they found it. You know, they're the original, and they they weren't looking for platinum; they were looking for iridium. They were looking for an iridium signature, similar to the dinosaur extinction event that's been found all over the world. And real quick, actually, can we talk about that too? I mean, you said similar to the dinosaur extinction event. How is this similar to that, and why is that significant? Well, you know, Wally Broker, who just passed away, was just really. Uh, well respected and famous yeah uh, scientist um, he actually had some influence on getting that Greenland study done because he originally was a skeptic of the younger dry impact and he knew some people that uh, were interested in testing the Greenland ice he was able to get them a X section of the ice core to test yeah I, I saw actually in the news the other day uh, you know Wally Brecker again I mean he's being reported in USA today yeah one of the leading climate scientists Really, I, who actually kind of wrote the book on climate change as we know it today. Oh, yeah. yeah. What does that mean to you, though? I mean, that right there toward the end of his life that he's looking at the YDB impact theory and going, guys, you know, we can no longer deny the evidence. Mm. Well, he was a major. Well, I mean, he was a, he was a critic. He was a critic early on. Uh, but then he came around uh, after seeing the evidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, he really he, he helped out the team that looked at the Greenland Ice Core and really thought that they would drive a nail in the coffin. He thought that they mm. would show that really the, nothing happened. Yeah. And it actually was the opposite. You know, we, we were talking about iridium as associated with the KT boundary with the extinction of the dinosaurs. Right. You know, and platinum in this case is um, kind of an equal, I guess, an equal indicator. And it, but, you know, but different. But you know, iridium is almost always associated in that situation with the you know, impact from an extraterrestrial body. But for platinum, you know, platinum does occur on on earth and it's you know it's it's a precious metal but right. it doesn't occur in uh and it, well actually it does occur in mineable quantities in some places but in this instance is it interpreted that the platinum is is associated with the with the impact object or is it associated with vaporization of the bedrock on the craton that's a good question yeah in, 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 in north america well that's a, that is a very good question because yeah. i think the when when the potato at all team found the Platinum spike, they were expecting if there was an impact, they would see an iridium spike. Right. right they didn't right. really see much iridium, but they found this huge platinum anomaly, and they concluded that, that it was consistent with the impact of a sub-kilometer size impactor of some sort. But it was an unusually fractionated. It's mm-hmm. not, you don't expect to see a large amount of platinum with, you know, to, without a lot of iridium coming in with it. Right, right. And there's been there's been YDB sites where they have reported iridium. Yeah. So we're not really sure what's going on. You know, maybe 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 we need to test more of the green ice sheet again to see if the iridium yeah. is really missing or maybe we just need to do another test. But there's, it's been found in other YDB sites. Yeah. Especially with the with the impact at the KT boundary, the iridium's associated usually is associated with a hard body like a an asteroid or or a, you know, a large meteorite, I guess you could say or, or a rocky or iron body. But a comet would not necessarily have iridium associated with it as an impactor, right? Well, I'm not sure. Maybe in the core. Yeah, maybe. You know, maybe yeah, right. in the very core. You know, yeah. a lot of people now are looking at what's the difference between comets and asteroids. Well, yeah. maybe, or some asteroids just exhausted comets. Yeah. There, yeah, there yeah, are yeah. The ice, the, right. the ice that, right, and right. other gases, the frozen gases have all melted away, and you have a core left over that maybe in some cases is enriched in some of these rare earth elements, including platinum and iridium yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And as this information is shared, we find ourselves here today at a very special site here in central South Carolina, one that you are heading up as a lead archaeologist. And what is it that we're finding here, and how does this play into the overall narrative of the platinum anomaly? 
And the beauty of White Pine, you know, Watts from 1980 did the original pollen study here. And that's one of the major paleontology studies for the southeast. And it's been used, you know, to really understand paleoclimate for the last 20,000 years. Uh, and so we came back to White Pond recognizing that there was likely an archive, a sedimentary archive within the lake, within the pond of peat and muddy sediments that would contain a portion of the younger dry onset that would contain sediments that would contain that we could look at for proxies uh, to see if those similar proxies for an extraterrestrial impact could be found in at White Pond. So it's really, you know, a lacustrian lake setting like this mm-hmm. is the perfect, you know, away from the ice sheet. The ice sheet is the gold standard. Yeah. You have these interannual layers of ice. It's as, really as good as it gets. A Greenland ice sheet is the, really the best thing we have. But mm-hmm. away from that, particularly in our area, sites like White Pond are really are our gold standard for really looking for these proxies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just amazing. I mean, that you've got such a, again, I, I guess you could call it a system. You know, I mean, there are going to be yeah. numerous archaeological sites right around this pond, but a pond that is relatively undisturbed and has been here for, what, close to 30,000 years probably. At minimum, right. I mean, the mm-hmm. work that this came out by Cross et al., uh, I think it was in Quaternary International or Quaternary Research. Yeah. Um, and the base of their core, we helped them collect a core in 2015, I think. Mm-hmm. And they went down six meters, and the bottom of their core was around 30,000. Wow. So that wow. provides a minimum day. Yeah. Here's a question that doesn't really have anything to do. It actually has to do with uh, carbon-14 dating. So carbon-14 dating, and for folks that don't know, is, you know, it's not, I mean, it's it's an exact science, but in such a way that it has to be calibrated to uh, you know, to the earth essentially. So, right. um, and there's places where they use um, the 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 annual uh, turnover of bodies of water as a way as a as a way to gauge or to calibrate the, the actual carbon fourteen date. So, my question is: Is White Pond a candidate? to be able to use for that type of... For refining on the calibration? That's exactly right, yeah. I, yeah, probably not, at least not from... We don't have sort of, uh, you know, the varved sediments that they you know that have been used elsewhere. We don't have the really... The area, the younger dryas layer that we're seeing that we've identified through radiocarbon at White Pond is a fairly narrow zone within the core, and it's, it's you know, inher- it's consistent in terms of the dates we're getting for, young, okay. for YD onset. We've identified that here. But it's not, we don't have any really sort of inner annual, you know, sort of laminated sediments that yeah, we might right. find elsewhere. Now, you go deeper in the core, and we're seeing that. And what's interesting, and I've talked with this about some of my colleagues and Mark Brooks and others, is that you go deeper in the core, you've got really nice sort of laminated sediments with layers of sand and mud and yeah. silt. And so those are, you know, can be used potentially for more precise kinds of yeah, calibration yeah, yeah. and dating. But okay. we're really relying on the work from the really the good calibration work that's been done elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sure. For calibrating us. Okay, yeah. Cool. Uh, Chris, I want to, I want to get a little bit more into you as an archeologist. So how long have you been an archeologist now? <laughs> uh, well, I've been uh, in South Carolina for about 11 years. Okay. Uh, I moved down from East Carolina university in North Carolina, Greenville, North Carolina, uh, 2008. Okay. Uh, and finished my PhD in 2009 down here yeah. while working for the Savannah River Archaeological Research Program. And what was your initial attraction to the world of anthropology and archaeology? What was it that got you involved with it? Oh, probably when I was four or five years old, I was put on a tractor and uh, put in first gear, and I would and to drive through tobacco fields yeah. and pull a sled behind it so that people could put the tobacco in there. And, and uh, <laughs> you couldn't get away with that these days. But, uh, <laughs> That's how I learned how to drive, actually. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, and I had to get off the seat to push in the clutch yeah. and hold on to the steering wheel, right? But, you know, they called me Eagle Eye because I would see, you know, spear points and arrowheads in the field. Yeah, yeah. And I would point them out, and I and I would just stop until someone would pick it up for me, you know. Yeah. Wow. wow. So wow. as a kid, okay. you were studying the lithics that you were finding in the fields and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, what, what was that like as a kid? You know, finding I, these you know, I didn't know much, obviously, at that time, but I was fascinated. You know, what are these things out here? What are they? What are these things that are laying all over the fields in the, the Piedmont, North Carolina, you know, all these tobacco fields? And I knew that, well, they were Indians, right, Native Americans. But I didn't know much else. And I have a small collection of shoebox and stuff that I picked up as a kid. Mm-hmm. And But that was really the the initial influence. A lot of us, you know, come up as starting out as somewhat as collectors, yeah, or at least sure. people that pick yeah. up stuff in plowed fields. You yeah. know, I didn't dig or anything at that time. Uh, but that was certainly the 
the initial influence that inspired me ultimately okay. to go into anthropology, archaeology. And now there's seldom a dig in South Carolina that you don't have a hand in. <laughs> yeah. uh, truly, yeah, I mean, right. every we seriously, every time we attend a conference where we see a lecture and they're yeah. doing a PowerPoint and they're showing the site, and here's Chris Moore, of course, you know, yeah. who's out and he's taking core samples or he's conducting, you know, an es- another aspect of the uh, excavation. Yeah. Did you right. ever think when you were a kid picking up arrowheads in fields that you would be contributing to scientific journals, writing papers that may reshape the way that we think about human origins and also the migrations into North America? Not for a second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah sure, but, man. I knew I was going to change the world, man. Yeah. But, but, man, you're extremely but, humble, too, man. I mean, yeah. You've got to get your due, man. But you have to understand, I will, I will say this, probably from the age of uh, my son's 11 now and certainly probably from his age, maybe even a little or younger than that until – so high school and other things kind of got my attention. You know, I was an avid amateur astronomer. Oh, really? really? Oh, yeah. oh, I was, I mean, on an extreme level. I mean, I was involved with the Greensboro Astronomy Club. You know, I had a telescope. We were looking at, you know, I was taking photographs of Halley's Comet when it came through in 86. Yeah, yeah, I remember uh, that. Yeah. I was drawing uh, ice caps on, on Mars. I mean, so I, through my telescope, you know, I was really, really a super nerd you know, in, yeah. in, a, in amateur astronomy. No wonder we get along so well. I mean, right. I've got yeah. a Celestron power seeker and a, any clear night in the summertime or actually in colder weather when there's actually better visibility, but I love amateur astronomy. That's been a, a passion of mine for a long time. So when we're not looking up, we're looking down, I guess, exactly. right? Yeah, I just sort of <laughs> yeah. changed direction after a while, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, let me address this then. With such a love for archaeology at a young age and also a love for astronomy, do you think it's an accident that you're involved with this research? No, I mean, I've talked with Alan West and others about this. I think I was inherently more open-minded to it. Yeah. I came in as a skeptic, but I was like, you know, there's a whole lot of data in the original Firestone paper, 2007 paper that came out, and I didn't agree with all of it. Right. And I know a lot of our colleagues and scientists and archaeologists who didn't want to have anything to do with it because of certain things they didn't agree with or thought couldn't possibly be. Yeah. But I thought, you know, this – there's too many things going on here and yeah. this, this deserves attention. And I was, I was simply, I was going to take whatever it, wherever it went, I was going to go with it. Whether, you know, whether I decided to stay a skeptic and not believe it or, or change my mind, I was going to look into it more. Yeah. And I think I was inherently predisposed to, to that because of yeah. the knowledge, you know, both in the, in the geology background that I have and understanding geologic history and impacts and how they've affected the earth over time and then having the astronomy background it was like we know these things happen right right? we know they happen and so and i think most people understand that too but they're not as inclined to think about it Mm. maybe it's other Absolutely. I just want people to remember when you're when you're hearing this conversation, I mean, this is the lead author on that Platinum Anomaly paper. That is such an important, that was a game changer for me too, because like you, I think I came into this primarily as a skeptic. And I'm trying to look at this, you know, again, systemically and think what is most likely and what is the accumulation of, of data that we have point to, and there's still a lot yet to be had. That's also very important to remember here. But as more and more data comes forward, again, a paper literally dropped right. in scientific reports two days ago exactly. that you were a co-author on, where we are right. now seeing many of the same sorts of features that have been indicative of this event, to right. call it that, you know, very generally speaking, in North America, now in South America, too. Right. And I, you know, again, the Seven Ages team, we got an email the other day from a colleague down around Monte Verde, and he said, we're all but celebrating down here because we're so excited about the results of this finding. Oh, right. It's an amazing site. The implications are incredible. I mean, right. so I just want people to remember who we're talking to. Right. You're kind of alumni here, too. I think this is your second uh, appearance here on the podcast now. So really, right. I think you, you've you been on this podcast now, strangely, more than anybody else. <laughs> so yeah. again, that, that's ex- extremely special to us, too. Right, right. Well, yeah. We'd give you a t-shirt if we had any. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, we'll get yeah. some. <laughs> we, actually, we need some. So I, I got a question for you. If you were to give advice to any you know, people that, especially young people, you know, people that are in high school right now or people that are interested in archaeology or anthropology, what would you, what would be your advice to them? Uh, I mean, you know, you really have, you got to go for it. You got to pursue your dreams. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I went, was an undergrad, I went to Appalachian State in Boone, North Carolina. I had this earlier passion for archaeology from a very young age. Uh, astronomy continued up until teenage years. Um, and then, but I was at the time I was heavily into music. Yeah, and so I went to Appalachia. So are we? Right. <laughs> yeah. and I said I'm yeah. going to I'm going to go up there. I'm going to major in music. Right. Yeah. Right. 
and uh, and I signed up for music courses. You know, I had all these electives out of the way, and we went to Appalachian State. Signed up for music courses and uh, took a, a course in anthropology. Uh, it was a prehistoric course with Larry Kimball, Professor Larry Kimball at Appalachian State. And I took that course, and within a day, I mean, everything clicked, and it, <laughs> it came back to, you know, my interest and passion as a kid and – I think it was a day or two later. I dropped every music course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you're a great guitar player, yeah. by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to say, yeah, yeah you're a phenomenal you know, guitar for the, player. Actually, for the listeners, I just want to say this: everybody sitting here at this table right now, and there's four of us. Obviously, we all play guitar. Some of us better than others, but of the four that are sitting here right now, I will say that Chris Moore and Mr. Mike Hanks to my left are by far the best. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm more of a guitar collector than a player. But uh, I want to say this. Uh, we're some old rockers, man. And uh, we love that 80s stuff. And right. we love to get on the guitar and play together. And, you know, that's as much of, you know, that's an important part of this. It's part of the, uh, the brotherhood. And I want to say something here right now on the microphone is um, we share a passion for and a love for music. And we also, uh, obviously, since we're here and, and you've gotten to know us, and we've gotten to know you over the years, we share that passion for archaeology and for history <clears throat> and for putting the pieces of the past together. Right. And I want to say right now, that you amongst others here in the Southeast have been more than you know, an influence and a, a mentor to all of us sitting here at the table of seven ages. As a team, we look to people like yourself for not only inspiration, but for guidance and for knowledge. And I got to say, man, every time I've messaged you, every time I've reached out to you, you've always been willing to share your information and your experience. And uh, that means more to us at seven ages than you could possibly know. So as we're coming up here on St. Patrick's Day, I want to give a toast and a thanks to Dr. Chris Moore for reaching out and being a mentor and a friend to cheers. all of us here at Seven Ages. So cheers to Dr. Moore. Cheers to you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> cheers. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good note to end on. Dr. Chris Moore, we look forward to future papers, future research, and future contributions. You're, again, an icon in the field. Thank you for spending time mm. with us. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Cheers. Always good to talk to Chris Moore. What was kind of unique about our trip to White Pond this year was – uh, fans of Seven Ages came out and volunteered at the site. And uh, one of our buddies, uh, Chris Cottrell of Dabbler's Den, came out, and we had an opportunity to sit down and talk with him for a while. That's right. Chris Cottrell became a fast friend. He was our roommate, in fact. And, of course, with a background in geosciences, he attended MSU, and he was one of a couple of alumni from that fine institution that we were hanging out with over the weekend. But he sat down on the mic with us to talk about his ongoing research into the Carolina Bay's enigma. And one thing you'll notice about Chris, he is somebody who's got a lot of interests, and hence I'm sure why he chose the name Dabbler's Den for his YouTube channel. More on that after a bit. First, we've got that audio from our conversation with Chris Cottrell. Chris Cottrell's with us, Mississippi State alumni, and right. he is joining us here to discuss geosciences. And you've been taking samples You've been driving us around all weekend and just <laughs> we, having an all around good that. time. Yeah. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. Doing great. Uh, I've learned more this weekend about Southeast archaeology than I have in the, my 41 years of life. So I, I've really been enjoying this weekend. It's really funny that you'd say that because so have we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm willing to bet you probably learned some yeah. things you might not have wanted to as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 But we do appreciate you driving, man. That's a... a yeah. Hey. <laughs> Any, anything I, I can do. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, your online enterprise is the Dabbler's Den. You have a That's YouTube right. channel. Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of stuff do you discuss on well, your channel? Well, the, the channel itself started off as just a way for me to to show my daughter the things that I dabble into throughout life. And uh, it's kind of morphed into a new dabble uh, where I um, have really gotten into this whole Younger Dryas um, you know, the catastrophe that may have happened. And, uh, and, and so the, the channel itself is, is focusing now on uh, the formation of the Carolina Bays. I guess it's an alternative uh, formation of the Carolina Bays. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of gone from there. I think I've got right now 21 separate videos just on that topic. And uh, I try to keep my videos short. And um, I, I'm an educator. I'm used to taking complicated topics and trying to break them down for, you know, 17, 18 year olds uh, for them to understand. And I try to do that on my channel. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things I think that's great about YouTube, I mean, this just has leveled the playing field for people. Uh, you can get a free account on YouTube. You can put videos up that right. anybody can find. You know, you've got a worldwide reach with something like that. And, right. you know, you find a niche like this. Although, again, I think that 
what you call dabbling, but what we might call, you know, the art of the generalist, Mm -hmm. you know, a person Mm -hmm. who is multifaceted in their interests and who goes after a lot of different subjects that they're passionate about. I mean, I can completely relate to that. Right. And it's not just geosciences. I mean, that's your academic background, but I mean, you cover all kinds of stuff on your channel. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the key. And I, and I think that we see a lot now where we have a lot of different people that spend their, all of their time focused on a, a very, um, specific topic, you know, even, even with archeology, span like we see here, you know, you got a lot of guys that focus, you know, all of their time inside of, you know, holes that they're digging and they, they have a, a wealth of knowledge about that one topic, but, you know, taking that and, and, and bringing in climatology, oceanography, you know, all of those kind of things. So I think that having a generalist idea or mindset is really what's going to help solve this whole mystery of, of, of the, uh, you know, the younger Dryas and, um, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting really close now. Yeah. You know, one of the things I think is, is really cool about your uh, your YouTube channel, and I think something that's very beneficial to people, especially your students, is um, visualizations. Mm-hmm. You know, being able to see some of these things. Right. It's one thing to talk about something as a concept, but I think a lot of people are, are uh, visual learners. And, uh, you know, and I know when I was a, a geology student, you know, we talked about a lot of concepts. Um, and sometimes those things didn't necessarily make sense until we got out into the field uh, you know, and saw those things, you know, in, in situ, uh, you might say, but, uh, you know, and I know you use, you use a lot of, uh, LIDAR products mm-hmm. on, uh, on, uh, your, uh, in your videos. And I think that's, uh, I think those are really, yeah, the, really good. I think the LIDAR tells the whole story. Yeah. Like yeah, I yeah, think yeah. if you learn how to read that LIDAR, it, you know, the whole thing is just laid out right there. And, um, you know, I, and that's what I try to do in the, in the video series is, you yeah. know, this is what. This is what's there. And, and again, with, with you, James, the, uh, you know, the geology is a hard science. You know, this it, is it something is, yeah. where, and, and when you start looking at the, the geological formations that have formed, that's the story. You know, you can't, right. you can't, you know, um, uh, you can't make it up. You know, you can't, uh, yeah. that's, you know, that's the story. You know, it, that, it, it's actually, <laughs> it's, it's actually rock solid. You know what <laughs> I mean? So, there right. it is, you know. That's right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. And, 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 I, and I tell these guys all the time, and I didn't make this term up, but geology a lot of times is referred to as an artful science. That's right. Because uh, you have to be f- uh, creative. You have to have a creative flair in such a way that, that sometimes when you see these things in, you know, in nature, you, you're, you're working to understand the processes that right. caused uh, you know, the, the, the rock formations or whatever it is to be, you know, as they are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, understanding of concepts and, you know, a, a bunch of different things that come together for that. Right. So it's all, you know, it, and you can talk about it, but until you really see it, it's, it's hard to put it together sometimes. So. Right. Right. And even that geology is that, you know, that is a focus science as well. Yeah. And a lot of times being able to connect the dots between, other, you know, uh, like, like climatology or, or the anthropology that goes along with it. And, and so being able to see all of that and pull it together, I think that's yeah. really going to be the key to, to, to solve yeah. the whole yeah, history. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of that firsthand experience, we are here in central South Carolina right now on a live active dig that we've all participated in. So Chris, when you go back and you're talking to your students, what type of uh, influence is this going to give to you when you're presenting this information to your kids and your different students throughout the, uh, the school? How is this going to help you? How is this firsthand experience going to reflect in how you teach? Uh, listen, any, any time that especially a science teacher can get in the field and, and get, you know, their hands dirty and, and actually do the work that's being done. Um, that is worth more than any course that I would ever take, you know, in a university or anything like that. And um, so, and, and I try to do that anyways. I spend every summer out on Sapelo Island doing ecological work, uh, coming out here and doing this. Um, you know, I, I think it's just, it's, it's invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. I was interested the moment you pulled up, and for two reasons. One, because you came in with beverages, ceremonial procedure. This guy must be completely in line with our way of thinking. But also, you had two buckets full of samples that you'd taken. That's right, yeah. Uh, Let's talk about that. What were you sampling? What are you looking for? What did you bring with you on this trip? Okay, so... Um, one of the things that, uh, that I'm looking at that differs from, I guess, the mainstream um, science view is uh, myself and a couple other of the, uh, I guess, 
uh, self-proclaimed scientists have been going out and, uh, and, and doing a lot of research and, you know, on the specifically about the Carolina bays. And, uh, right now we want to focus a little bit more on, um, some parabolic dune features that are found along with the Carolina bays in, in many areas, uh, that they're all Eastern facing. It's all, it, they, they've been called or termed, uh, um, parabolic dunes, but I think that they're more, and I have a video that you guys can go out and check them on my uh, YouTube channel, but, um, I think they're more tsunami chevrons. Now, I don't think tsunami is a proper term to use, uh, so I've been using the term splash chevron, uh, where a, you know, chunks of the Laurentide ice sheet, uh, after a primary impact, uh, sent just a barrage of, uh, ice chunks and slush and just, just a, a mess all over the East Coast. And uh, it, it, again, you know, the LIDAR shows the markings all across the East Coast, um, you know, perfect ellipses. Um, and, and, so, and, and then you also have these splash chevrons. So we're, I, I'm spending a little bit of time, uh, myself, uh, Antonio Zamora, and uh, we're, we're uh, getting some samples from these parabolic dunes. And we are going to be uh, uh, sifting them and looking for any signs that show that they are um, uh, not windblown sand deposits, but more uh, moved in one, one you know, swift motion, uh, you know, more a splash chevron. Right. Okay. So you think that these are, you know, getting down to brass tacks, that these are impact features, the mm-hmm. Carolina Bays. Yes. Yeah, secondary impact features from a, uh, a primary impact feature into the Saginaw Bay area of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. What do you say to folks who say these are lack of string, these are lake formations? I just, I don't see it. I just, I, I don't see how you, how, even if you try to make two perfectly shaped Carolina, just two of them would be uh, impossible. I, I, I don't, I don't see how that could, can happen using terrestrial wind features, you know, using, um, the, 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 uh, supposedly every Carolina Bay should be a lake, uh, or a pond of some kind. And they have been reshaped over a long period of time. Uh, and, and I just don't see how, that you can even get two to be perfectly shaped like that. And we have tens of thousands of them across the entire Southeast. Uh, plus you also have the, uh, Nebraska rainwater basins that are exactly the same shape and they're on a completely another part of the world, far, far away. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so, so that's where I'm coming from with that. And, uh, and, you know, I'm hoping that the, the work that we're doing right now, uh, will help strengthen that at least a little bit. So Yeah, by the way, I'm sure people probably think that there's like an elevator or something behind us. We're in a hunting lodge, and they have a security system, so every time that door opens and people come in and out, yeah. you're hearing that little beep. I, I yeah. know you may think this is crazy. I think I'm more in the lake camp. I really am. But I, I, but I know, and I feel, I feel odd this weekend, especially. You know, when I do my, my, my videos, it's just me. You know, I, I, I've got my ideas. I'm putting them out there. And, and as I think I told you guys earlier, I wouldn't be doing this. I'm my personality type. I would, I would, if I didn't believe in this, like with everything I had, I'd be fishing or, you know, hunting. And that I just, I, I really do think that this is what happened and I wouldn't be putting it out there and, and really pursuing it like I have been. Uh, but I really think that that's what happened. Well, here's so. the great thing about all this though. Okay. So let's say, you know, you're the impact, you know, theorist mm-hmm, and, right. and I believe there's a lack of string explanation. We've also hung out all weekend right? and it ain't a, an issue if we come at it from different oh, angles. I think it's not, so yeah. important when people are entertaining a scientific attitude and approach, even right. if they differ on the mechanism. Right. And that's why I wanted yeah. to come up here uh, mainly for this weekend. I know, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Moore is here, and he, he's written lots of papers about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I, I 100% respect everything that he's done, and everybody out here, I mean, they have put in so much great work. Uh, you know, I, I pretty much agree with 99% of everything he's ever done and said, and, but, but the formation of the Carolina Bays, I just I don't see it, and, and that's where I'm going with it, so... Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that's fair enough. And again, you know, that's seven ages. That's what we want to do. We want to give, you know, (laughs) honestly, we want to give fair time and, and and a speech to everybody. We want both sides to be represented so that the listeners can make uh, their own research and and make their minds up for themselves. Right. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's a good thing. We're having a conversation. Um, and nobody's getting angry, right? <laughs> well, so, I don't know about you, Waldo, but I'm angry. You're pretty, yeah, you're I'm pretty mad, mad at you. Yeah. you know, I, I'm going to get mad about something that, yeah. that may have happened 13,000 years yeah, ago, yeah, and that's yeah. going to end our friendship. But, you know, the, <laughs> the thing I was saying about interpretation is, you know, we're all looking at the same formations, and people are, you know, are interpreting in different ways. So, um, and these are all known processes mm-hmm. that could be responsible for the formation of these things. And right. how this how this mystery gets solved is through the collection of data. So, That's like right. the, the work that yeah. you're doing right now is going to is going to add 
to the solution of this right. mystery. Right. Ultimately. The only thing that's one hundred percent is that it did happen. It did happen. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, actually, outside that, there are some who would look at the younger drives. Nobody disputes the younger drives. Right. Exactly. That's what I meant. But outside, you know, it's like there are layers of all this. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we can look more specifically at the at the you know Carolina base. Different opinions on their formation, but then mm-hmm. you come up to the younger drives. Different theories about what caused the drives. Now, right. unequivocally, I think we're all well. You know. Again, I'm not an outlier on the impact hypothesis. I actually have been persuaded that there is something to that by the accumulation of evidence. But Mm -hmm. when I first came into this, I remember, Jason, you and I were on the phone one day. And uh, you'd said, you know, I want to know, where are you on that? And I kind of was like, you know, I've read all these papers that explain, you know, the younger dryas merely as a process of the natural deglaciation at the end of the Pleistocene. And I thought, you know, I, I don't know if this is an impact. Then the platinum anomaly, which Chris Moore, who's sitting outside on the front porch, he was the co or I'm sorry, the lead author on that paper, co authored by some true legends in the field. I mean, again, that was a game changer to me, but then there's been so much additional information forthcoming. At this point, I have to very seriously entertain that. Right. But there are many on the next level up who are like, you know, guys, look, I don't care how much more evidence is forthcoming. This has already been debunked. End of discussion. We don't have to keep talking about this. Right. To which I say so if there's more information and it keeps coming forth and it's and again it seems to be pointing at the idea that something along the lines of an extraterrestrial impact occurred right. you're not going to look at the new evidence you've already made up your mind despite what that evidence says exactly and there's yeah. there's more and more stuff coming out. i mean literally right right now you know the paper just came out two days ago that's in support of the right. dryas right. impact uh, you know if, if you're not on on your game then you're missing something, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know, got to read a lot, <laughs> right, right, and those things can't be ignored. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there's a, you know, the tide is in the direction of this, you know, uh, of confirming this, mm-hmm. the, the the impact hypothesis. Yeah, so, I think so too. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of good work, and uh, right now nobody's doing any work that, where the data is coming in that it's that's refuting this hypothesis. It's all in that. It's all in that direction. So it's, I mean, it's looking like that, but you know, we're all on the same team, right? You know, and you got to go where the data goes, right? right? So, yeah. And yeah. ultimately, each individual piece could be a little bit right. Yeah. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. 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 To paint the whole picture. You yeah. Remember Hawking, though? I mean, and he's not the only one that said it, but the late Stephen Hawking, again, you know, the, the idea that physicists have for so long been looking for a grand unified theory that simply explains a wide you know, array of phenomena in the universe. But he said, you know, we may never actually find a grand unified theory, one that catches all and explains all these little things right down to the quantum level. Right. We may have to settle for partial theories. And that's the most important thing, I think, about having different opinions that are all looking at something uh, analytically, scientifically, right. we're all trying to find out. And sometimes you're going to find a bit here that's correct, a bit here that's correct. And that's why I think that being a generalist is so, it's such an important, yeah. you know, an important part of this whole thing, because you, I, I, I feel like that I can, you know, kind of extend myself out and see the broader picture, uh, you know, more clearly, I think, than a lot of even some, some people that have been dealing their whole life working on, you know, one specific topic for a long period of time. Yeah. And so being able to present that and put it out there for people to see, I think that's, that's, where, my, that's where I feel like I fit in. So. What do your students think? Do they, do they think that you'd like to Oh, they've been all into it now. They, yeah, I, I, yeah. I start my course off by, you know, I, I try not to show them a lot of the Carolina Bay stuff that I have on YouTube. I try to, uh, you know, let them, if they want to see it on, on their own. Um, I actually... Uh, my my Carolina Bay portion of the uh, YouTube channel uh, is is actually a presentation that I put together that I that I definitely plan on presenting to live and you know live you know an audience uh, and so I practice with them oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I get yeah, a new yeah. set of students every you know every semester so I start off each semester because I know I'm going to be talking about Carolina Carolina Bays and the Younger Dry so I have to start off each semester talking about and I teach Earth Systems right now and. Next semester, I'll be teaching, uh, you know, a couple of geology classes. And, and so it's important for me to go ahead and say that. So I, I get the chance to practice my presentation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know yeah I, sure. Yeah, and I, you know, the word probably gets on the street about you, right, too, as right. far as, the, you know, the material that you have on YouTube. Right, and, and it just so. so happens that, like, right now, we're working on sedimentation. And so then uh, they'll actually be able to help out with the process. Uh, and we're going to be able to sift through a lot of the sand that I've been collecting this weekend. And uh, the, they'll be part of the process. It was just, they think this is very cool. They think that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I it think is it's cool. I think it's cool too. Yeah, yeah. Where, where can people find you online, by the way? Uh, right now, the best place is on YouTube, um, The Dabbler's Den. 
you know, and, and um, I do have uh, Dabbler's Den email. They can reach me at uh, dabblers.den at gmail.com. Um, and, and, you know, I, I try to reply to everybody who's got, uh, you know, something to say, whether it be through a YouTube channel or uh, through an email. And uh, so, yeah. so anytime. Yeah. 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 And your videos are really good, too. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you once again for joining us on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Oh, man, I, it's, it's been a great time this weekend. Thanks, guys. And it's always great to hear from our friend Chris Cottrell. Uh, we keep in touch and talk pretty often, and I'm sure we'll hear more from him in the future. One name that kept popping up over the last couple of years that everyone kept saying we needed to talk to is Chris Judge. So it was great to finally meet him in real life, sit down with him, have a little bit of uh, Irish whiskey, and uh, have a great conversation. Continuing in our series on long-haired legends of archaeology, Chris Judge, I'm going to start off with one word, Kolb. This site intrigues and fascinates us. We've been learning a lot about that today, and you, of course, have been instrumental in the research that goes on at that site. Why don't we start right there? Well, in, in um, 1996, I met a guy named Chip Helms, mm -hmm. and as a teenager, he collected this site. He wrote handwritten letters to the state archaeologist, uh, asked for a team archaeologist to come out and dig there. And he would get beautiful handwritten letters back from the state archaeologist, Bob Stevenson, saying, thank you, here's your site number, this is great, These, this one's that, this, this is that old, and, um, but we don't have money to do it. And then he became a successful doctor, and he convinced the DNR. When I was there, I used to have Sean Taylor's job at DNR to go down there and do that. And so that's how it got started. It was a bit of a fluke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, that site is significant for a number of reasons. What period are we talking about primarily? Well, we have everything from uh, Dalton to World War II. Yeah. So we've got the entire prehistoric sequence from the late Ice Age uh, on up through. Uh, we don't have a lot of Mississippian. There's, mm. a, there's a little bit there. Uh, there's a nearby large Mississippian site. Uh, then we, we have no Civil War. We have no Rev War, which is kind of odd. Uh, they are around nearby, but they're not on site. And then there's a, there's a, a colonial site there. Johannes Kolb and his wife, Sarah uh, emigrate from the uh, from Germany to Germantown, Pennsylvania, and then in 1732 they pick up their family and they move to the back country of South Carolina, and so they pioneer there. They have nine children and they live there, probably in a, uh, a house built without nails. Wow! Um, yeah. So that's the that's the first historic component. Then we have a, there's a slave row there, which we think starts about 1790. Jonas Cope dies in 1765. We sense one of his children lives there after that. And then from 1790, really, to the, uh, to the end of the Civil War, there seems to be a slave community living there out in the middle of nowhere. Oh. And then there's a logging camp right around the time of the First World War. A lot of dynamics going on right there. There's a lot of things going on, which is good and bad. You know, we're here at White Pond where there's a, really a single component. There's uh -huh. a lot of clarity. It's easy to view that site and figure out what's going on. We have the cultural landscapes, the human imprint on the surface of the earth, all, all piled up on each wow. other there. So those, the, the, at the Culp site, so those gaps, um, you know, in, the, in knowledge, what do you attribute those to? To the no, being no Civil War. Yeah, yeah well, war. in Mississippian, you know. There, oh, the, Miss, the, the Mississippian, well, it's a sandy site, and it wouldn't have been a very good agricultural site. And as you know, the Mississippians are growing, growing crops. So it may have been that the sand itself uh, was not productive. It's not yeah, conducive sure. to agriculture in general. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can't grow a turnip in it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. That's one way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, and and right. so how, how long was the excavation at this site and how long were you involved personally? Uh, I was involved from the very beginning until the end. We, we, we did a 20 year project that ended in 1996. And so, going, going back to the beginning of the story, if you will, the paleo period. So how far back are we going in the paleo period? Are we talking Clovis? Are we talking Redstone, Dalton? Where are we at? Well, I, th I think we have Clovis there. We have a, we have a small fragment of a quartz piece it's underneath a early archaic side notch tailor component. So okay. we have two, and then we also have the base of a Sewanee, which would be late Paleo Indian, the, right. after the fluted tradition goes away, and they're uh, making things like redstones in different points. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you also, you talked to Jason and I outside about uh, your study with triangle points also, and that you wanted to extrapolate some particular information about that. Yeah. You know, you said, <laughs> and this is funny because he goes, I don't know if that would really be good for the podcast. And Jason and I are like, oh, that's exactly what we want to talk about. So I, I want to get We, we into, never know not, what people want. Not to put you on the spot, but. But I do want to get you, you know, I want to get your opinion on, you know, what you're trying to do, what you've noticed, and what that seems to indicate, and what you hope to learn. Okay, well, you're talking to a guy that's done pottery all his life. The, 
this, the late Paley Indian stuff is one book, and on the other end are triangular points, the last points made by uh, prehistoric people before the uh, flintlock tray gun is introduced. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, people said they shrink through time. And a friend of mine pointed out, I thought it was the length, it was actually the width. I went back and read everything on it, and no one had ever done a study. So I was curious about, can we document that? So I've been collect- I started about 10 years ago collecting information. Uh, I've got uh, 135 sites, 4,000 points from Virginia to Florida, most of them in the Carolinas. And they do seem to drop off if you average the basal width of a number of points you get the average of those, it seems like they drop in five millimeter levels from the early woodland through the Mississippi. And I'm trying to find sites that I can, that do not agree with, with the model that I put together, but everything seems to kind of fit in there. You mentioned that many academics have noted this in the past. Why do you think a study had not been done up until this time? Was it just not something that enough people were interested in? Or well, As a pottery guy, I think I can speculate. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not nearly as exciting as doing paleo points. You know, there's little trial, you know, no one's ever looked at it, I guess. Uh, a few people have looked at it, but it's sort of, people like the old stuff, as you guys know. Sure, sure. Yeah. This, is, this, yeah. is the re- this is the recent version. What's the compelling stuff? But I mean, we learn so much from the nuanced aspects of this, like what you're talking about. That's why I find that interesting, you know, but, but in the long run, I mean, what would you hope to learn? What does that seem to point to, or is it too early even to say? Well, I fell down in a rabbit hole because what I was trying to do was at the Cove site, we have tens of thousands of pottery shards. Very confusing. We live on the edge of several different traditions. Mm -hmm. And so if you looked at the, you know, El Paso and the opposite side of the Rio Grande, Further you move away one direction, it's going to be very Hispanic culture. As you move the other way, it's Anglo. Right. So we're on, we're on an edge like that. And so I thought we have 500 triangular points. If we could figure out a way of dating those, and I'm not lazy, but I'm just trying to save time. Oh, we know maybe, you're not lazy. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's, a, maybe that's yeah. a, a better way of going about it. And if we could date those. So I've, I've set up this model. We're about to do some carbon dating from features that have triangular points in them and try to see if I can – uh, we're very fine tuned, but the whole uh, focus of that study was to bring it back to Kolb and try to milk some information out of that site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, one thing, and I had, I had, I guess I hadn't really thought about it until just now. But you were talking about the introduction of flintlock firearms, uh, you know, to North America. Uh, I guess that was essentially, it, it, at least as they moved, uh, you know, from east to west, that was essentially the end of the lithic tradition in North America. You see, you see a two-phase thing happen. The first phase, you see them making points out of the bottom of green wine bottle gla- bottles. Really? Wow. Using that glass. And that's wow. very, very brief. And then they're all walking around with flintlocks. Wow. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess in a way that's, uh, that's the next Clovis point, right? Well, it would be using the new <laughs> material source. And you see similar things among the Aboriginal traditions Man. in like Australia, New Zealand, things like this, where they're taking literal, actual, you know, glass <clears throat> bottles and, uh, you know, working points from this. I mean, this, this is the exact thing. So do you yeah. want to go right, you know, where these start are in the coastal yeah. plain along the coast, there is no rock down there. Yeah. So right. You, you sure. have to move yeah, up yeah. to the topper site to find good rock. Yeah. Right. So if you all of a sudden have these people drinking out of wine bottles and they're, uh, uh, disposing of these <laughs> yeah. beautiful p- clear crystal glass. I yeah. mean, why not, not use it? Well, right, exactly. I mean, the yeah. difference between, you know, uh, produced glass and, and chert, uh, you know, as far as uh, production of, of uh, lithics goes is, is really, I mean, there's really no difference in it. I mean, it's silica, right? And, and the way that it, the way that it breaks and the way, you know, the way that it flakes or whatever is essentially the same thing. Right? The only, the only beauty of glass is that it's homogenous. It's, yeah. there's no per, uh, imperfections. In right. It. right. No, fossil, no inclusions no fossils, or anything no, like that. Yeah. Exactly. And it's a soft material that's usually used. So we see a transition yeah. there, you know, a brief transition. So, you know, that's a very interesting point. And I've only heard that mentioned a couple of times. So if we're looking at the historical record in amounts of those type of points, what are we seeing in sites like this? Of the glass points? Of the glass points. Very, yes. very few. I know of a handful. Really? Wow. Yeah. But so that's a very, very short period of time, though, geologically speaking, that that would comprise. I mean, we're talking about, you know, decades, maybe hundreds of years. I don't know. Uh, this would be from, you know, the uh, decades, the late 16th century to the early 
18th century. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, yeah, not very much. So, so, again, in terms of the broader scale of human history, I mean, that's just not a whole lot of time for the accumulation of these kinds of artifacts right. with that material. Yeah. 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 You, guys, you guys know about Santa Elena and Beaford? Tell us, Spanish, please. Spanish yeah, I mean, There's no glass there. Yeah. Of any kind. There's very little. The only ones would be decorative in the wealthiest people's houses. So that, mm. that, that site ends in 1587. So it's from that point forward, uh, you'd see glass. So ultimately, you've been you worked at the Culp site for 20 years. You saw all the, all the different you know, features and the time period on a very dense site full of a great assemblage of artifacts there. So uh, what about other things besides what we typically find at sites, points and pottery and things like that? Hard stone items, anything that has been discovered? Well, we've, um, I've been looking at the gorgets from the Cove site and, and another site nearby called Savannah Edge, which is also on the same uh, heritage preserve, Great PD Heritage Preserve there. And I'm interested in those because we yeah. don't know too much about them. They've been thought of as things worn around the neck, uh, braces that archers wear on their inner wrist to protect from the bowstring hitting them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tarek and I were, were, were thinking of them as maybe a, a thing for weaving fishing line and maybe even a pocket fisherman where you have that right. in your hand and yeah. you pull back. Uh, and so there's been a lot of ideas about these things. And so I'm trying to figure out what's going on with those. And we know that a lot of times they're intentionally broken. Right. But you rarely find a whole one. A lot of times you can tell just by the way it's been broken that it would be very hard to have broken it uh, and in any other way, but in an intentional, intentional format. So we have those. We don't. We have maybe a handful of ground stone axe fragments from coal, and we've got a little bit of soapstone as far as non-chip stone mm. things from yeah. the coal side. Anything along the lines of banner stones found? We have probably three or four banner stones. Yep. Really. And I'm wondering if they're broken intentionally because they're pretty thick. And right. But uh, actually, I saw someone break one this summer. In use? A replica one, yeah. yeah. And so are there any uh, carbon dates, anything like that coming from those layers? Are we able to see uh, distinct separations between time periods? For the gorgets? Uh, gorgets and hard stone items. Yeah, the, gor- the gorgets, I can tell you, are from the late archaic. We've got them uh, in association with Tom's Creek Pottery, Okay, one of the, one of the older potteries in the United States. Um, on up through the Middle Woodland, they seem to range in that area. Another item that is coeval with those are sherds used, ceramic sherds broken, used as a braiders. Ah, yes. Very interesting. So that's, that's kind of neat to see. Well, briefly was. also about the intentional destruction of these artifacts. That reminds me, you know, when we spoke with Dr. Carballo about Teotihuacan, there is that ritual destruction of pottery, of mm-hmm. other kinds of, of items. That's fascinating to me because, I mean, that seems to maybe not show any kind of direct connection, but nonetheless, there seems to be a cultural continuity. Uh, what, how would you interpret that, even if you were to speculate? I, would, I wouldn't know about connections to Mesoamerica, but it's interesting, you know, when you destroy something, the value of anything that remains goes up. Yeah, this so is all true. A, if there's some symbolic or, or monetary value in them. If you continue to make them, you flood the market. If you destroy them and there's only a few, the next person has to have their own, then maybe that value remains or increases. I don't know. That's right. It's been what, an interesting kind of a phenomenon, though. Well, it is, you know, and so you do see certain continuities, and, and that's not to say that there is a direct connection or any kind of a correlative relationship, but I still find that fascinating, and that's one of the joys that we find in, in learning about this stuff. Final question, your joy. What do you love the most about this, Chris? About archaeology? Yeah. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, I like sharing it with people. You know, yeah. uh, I very early in my career ran across people like Al Goodyear. Who oh, yeah. Came out of Arkansas with this idea of public archaeology that, you know, the public pays for it. And for a long time, what we did was we wrote very technical reports that I'm not sure if even I understand. And, uh, <laughs> you and me both, sir. You and me both. And uh, It's pretty, pretty pretty uh, nice for an and we just sort of like you know in, you know inform ourselves rather than the, the 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 masses and so i've i've always enjoyed trying to and and i'm not one of those smart people and so i have to understand oh, it at a regular i level. would contest I mean, that. I'm, no, I'm kidding no i'm not kidding I, I understand things when i simplify them and i don't use big words and but i really like turning people on i would family. merely say this though chris you simplify that but then you when you bring it to the microphone like this and you you share your interpretation of it. That makes it more accessible to other people. 
that is incredibly important. And so I want to thank you. And that's for, what I, that's what yeah. I like about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I want to thank you again for being a Great part of this. To Good yeah. to talk Thanks to you too, Chris. Man. It yeah. won't be the last time. I hope not. Great to be able to kind of retrospectively listen to all these interviews so many weeks after they were recorded. You hear something new on each new listen. And the next gentleman that we'll be hearing from, Tariq Gafar. James, I think you've referred to him as an international man of mystery, and he certainly is that. Tarek is not only a man of mystery, he is also a machine when it comes to moving dirt. So this guy works harder than anybody I've seen on the site. Um great guy and you know this this interview he's he's very focused and he has quite an interesting story uh it kind of struck a nerve with me and uh, i found myself fascinated with uh, what he had to say yeah absolutely and just to add what you're talking about when we're there on the site i learn more from Tarek than probably anyone else he is truly one of the most knowledgeable and precise archaeologists i've ever had the pleasure of being around so without further ado Tarek gafar archaeologist extraordinaire there's a precision that you bring to your work. And I'm telling you, I've worked with a lot of these guys out here watching. I'm no professional. You certainly are. You bring so much to this, but there's a backstory there, too. I want to start with your name, Tariq Gafar, because there's an interesting meaning to that that I think has relevance to what we're talking about here. Well, the name Tariq is uh, an Arabic word that means a traveler who comes knocking on your door. And the name Gafar means the one who forgives. So I don't know exactly how that affects me, but um, I feel that somehow it must. You know? <laughs> I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. And, you know, to begin this conversation, a lot of times we immediately start talking about someone's career or their past or how they got interested in these things. But you have a very unique and fascinating story that you shared with me yesterday about your ethnic heritage and where your family came from and the stories about your father. So I want to begin there tonight and get a little bit of insight to where you and your family have been that brought you to this point in your life. Yeah, so my father is from Uttar Pradesh in central northern India. Uh, when he was about 14, he was forced to go to Karachi during the partition. And uh, Karachi at that time was called the City of Refugees. My mother, on the other hand, was from central Jutland in Denmark, and uh, her father was a pork and dairy farmer. Um, she went to London to make her way in the great white world, and starting out as a, a young au pair girl, and my father, having gone to the University of Karachi, was able to get into the University of London, where they met. And that's where we began. And uh, I was born in Denmark, um, raised in London, and then Glasgow, and then Edinburgh. But before we could leave Denmark, uh, there was an interesting symbolic thing that happened, and that was nobody would give me a passport. <clears throat> I couldn't go to England because... I didn't have an English passport. Denmark did not recognize me as a Danish citizen. And um, so my father applied to citizenships in Denmark, England, and Pakistan. I received all three. And when we moved back to England, I just assumed the nationality of an English person. Now, here in America... I'm different, you know. Uh, I consider myself very much an American. But when I'm among Americans, I'm not kind of not an American. When I'm in Scotland, I'm certainly not Scottish. And when I'm in England, I'm not English. And when I'm in Denmark, yeah. I'm not Danish. Yeah, you're when a traveler. I'm a, I'm a traveler. Yeah. My friend Kenny Pinson calls me the man with no country. So 
what I didn't realize is I was kind of being preconditioned to be an anthropologist mm. uh, so that really, no matter where I am, even here in South Carolina, when I look at my South Carolinian friends, I might as well be looking at Mongongo nut-eating Trobrian Islanders. Right. Um, they are as different to me as anybody. And that kind of a, it transfers itself onto what I look at in terms of historical anthropology and archaeology. Tariq, you said that you know, this aspect of your background sort of puts you in the place of you know, a mindfulness, I guess, for anthropology. And of course, you know, in the way that you bring that to the work that you do in the field, again, I know I'm watching you up there in a plot, in a hole in the ground. Again, I think it's a machine-like quality that you have. You are so good at the way that you move, the way that you take your measurements. I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody in the job who works the way that you do. How do you blend? Is there a spiritual side of that as well as the the side that is academically oriented in terms of the way that you go about what you do when you're on the job? Yes. Um, so the first 10 years I was in archaeology professionally, I worked in cultural resource management. And in that field of work, there is a certain sense of a conflict of interest. You want to retrieve the best information you can, the most accurate information that you can. At the same time, the person that's paying you to do so wants you to do it very fast, yeah. as fast as you can. And you want to compete with the other people who are working with you. So when all the stars are aligned, you, you get it just right. And when I left the field of CRM to come here to South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, all of those sort of a combination of priorities and skills came into play. And um, I guess I just inadvertently learned how to do something that was valuable. I like that. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, getting into the job itself, I mean, first of all, I think your story is inspiring. And I find I kind of find myself in awe listening to you um, you're so deliberate in the way you speak and, and concentrated on the facts. And that's the same sort of focus that I noticed last year at the dig site, the same thing that I see this year. But working in this field, and you've been doing this for a long time now, um, I think your areas of expertise and the places that you've worked are as interesting and as diverse as your culture and all the places that you've been in your life. So, Give us kind of a, a chronology of some of the sites and places throughout the world that you've worked in the field of archaeology. Oh, my gosh. Um, so uh, the first and largest project that I did was the Francis Marion survey after Hurricane Hugo in 1990. Um, it was a large survey. It was a long survey, and it taught me how to survey in terms of phase two or testing, digging larger, uh, larger units, uh, nothing could be, can be said. The, the Kolb site would be the, the 38 DA 75 was definitely the most educational site that I've ever worked on. Uh, every test unit had features in it. Um, the, there were probably a thousand artifacts per five centimeter level in every uh, two meter by two meter square. It was uh, overwhelmingly uh, generous in its information that it gave us. Um, uh, we worked on Fort Johnson, uh, which was uh, War of 1812, Civil War. Um, military installation in Charleston, Gettysburg, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, we all know. There are just so many projects. Uh, right now, for the past three years, I've been working on Goodwill Plantation, which uh, established 
1730, but it has uh, prehistoric records on it going back to probably 14,000 years. And then, of course, there's White Pond, which um, has turned into a sort of one of those things that doesn't go away. You know, and a continuing project is always so much better than in CRM. When we do a phase two or a phase three or even a survey, it could be the last time anything will be done with the site before it is destroyed by um, development. Uh, The best sites I've ever worked on, some of them uh, are under golf courses, parking lots of uh, of. Car, sh- car dealerships, um, you name it. Walmart. There's a Walmart over one of the best golf cor- uh, best uh, golf courses, one of the best sites <laughs> I've ever worked on. So uh, yeah, it's um, it's. Uh, I've been very fortunate with uh, with the mm-hmm. sites that I've gotten to work on. And you've even had opportunities to work overseas, is that correct? Yes. Uh, I did my field school in Ireland under Chris Judge um, with the University of uh, South Carolina in Lancaster. And um, I um, have worked in Denmark. I worked for the Viborg Stift Museum uh, on uh, a survey and also on the excavation of an Iron Age um, sod house. Wow, incredibly diverse. You know, there's there's something I want to touch on here because, again, um, we do a lot of interviews, and quite honestly, we, we talk to a lot of people, and we always enjoy it, and there's a certain vibe and a certain feel that you get from different people, and I just got to say that uh, tonight seems to be one of those special nights, and there's a lot going on here today, but something specifically that you spoke about earlier I want to touch on here is you mentioned... Um, here in the States that, you know, with your friends and and different places in the world, you never really feel like you, you fit in with those particular people, a hundred percent, if you will, when you're doing this work and you're discovering the past and you're looking at these cultural features and you're thinking about the lives of those people, do you feel a connection to those people? Yes, I I definitely do. Um, I've, uh, spent time in, uh, in Karachi, in Pakistan, with my grandparents. And um, in that environment, even in, I guess, in the mid-80s, there was no water, um, except for during, I believe, one or two hours per day. And so they would store their water in large clay vessels. And these clay vessels were very central to the life of my family there. And... um, So when I'm looking at pottery shirts, especially the big ones where I can tell that it's from a large vessel, I can't help but think about that. And recently my father did share with me a a written description of his home that he grew up in in Uttar Pradesh, which was basically a house made out of clay, a house made out of wattle and daub. And, um, he described to me how the interior of the house looked and how the um, the cooking area looked. And incidentally, um, a little aside, uh, he described the cooking area as being uh, about a telephone booth size space with a small wall halfway up, maybe four or five feet up. And my grandmother uh, had constructed a horseshoe-shaped kind of a raised pedestal upon which a pot could sit and fuel could be placed underneath. And that was how he grew up having his meals cooked for me. Well, it just so happens that at Fort Johnson, I excavated a War of 1812 kitchen site. And in that site, we found... um, a cooking area up against a large hearth which was constructed with bricks three bricks set at 90 degree angles forming a square horseshoe 
And that was the same structure that my own grandmother had. And when I find I'm working on a daub structure, you know, a, a, a prehistoric daub house, I can't help but think about, you know, my own father's home when he was growing up. Absolutely. When you uh, have that kind of perspective, I guess, you know, thinking about your own father's living conditions growing up and, you know, being able to apply that to archaeology, what is the big takeaway? Not to ask a, a you know, too broad or generalized question, but, you know, having worked on such a diversity of archaeological sites in different places, in different conditions, what is, if there is a continuity, what is the takeaway that you bring from this in terms of what it says about the ancient world, you know, how it affects your worldview today? If there is any continuity, it is that whether we're looking at people in the prehistoric times, paleo through Mississippian, whether we're looking at people in historic times, we are, or we're, whether we're looking at ourselves in modern times, we're looking at we're looking at people. People are people throughout all of history and prehistory. We're not any different. We're not any different from one culture to another. We're all the same. Yeah, why is that so hard for people to figure out, you think? <laughs> I think people just don't travel enough. There yeah. you go. I, I amen, agree with that. Amen actually, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that there's so many different paths that lead here where someone gets involved with anthropology with archaeology and so i think we all share a passion and we all look at it a different way and it all brings something different to each one of our lives so my final question for you would be when you look over your life and you look over your career especially in your career in archaeology what is the one thing that you would say is most meaningful to you in your life on a daily basis I have to say that on a daily basis, the thing that's most important to me is the community in which I live and work. Um, my interests would be considered craziness if it wasn't for the institution of anthropology. Um, and uh, I would feel crazy if it wasn't for my colleagues and friends in anthropology. Um, uh, I have so much debt to them for teaching me over the years. People like Chris Judge and Carl Steen and James Legg and Mona Grundon and Natalie Adams. The, the, the list goes on and on. Um, anthropology is, um, is truly a network here in South Carolina, at least. No, absolutely. And, and you know, honestly, we consider you part of that network and you have more influence over people than I think you may even realize yourself being able to watch you yesterday and, you know, in that, that square that you had open, you had it marked out, you had it, uh, you were, you were finding and flagging it and tagging it and documenting it. And being able to watch someone work so efficiently and with so much passion, focus and concentration that was the topic of our conversation over dinner last night. So you have an impact. We were looking at someone who was so focused and we are avocationalists at this. So every opportunity that we have to see someone who's masterful in their work and their skill, that makes an impact on us. So, you know, I think I speak on behalf of the entire Seven Ages team when I say that you amongst many of the people that are here tonight are mentors to us. And we want to say thank you for your time and for the effort that you put forth, because it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you very much. Tariq Gafar, thank you for being our guest on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Appreciate it. And we certainly want to thank uh, Tariq for his time. Again, I, I gained a lot of inspiration in, from his story and, and just found his interview to be fascinating. And a couple other guys we had the opportunity to sit down with. You hear these guys' names pop up on the podcast from time to time, and that's because they keep in touch with us. They're our good friends, Dan Newbanks and Chris Corley. Continuing our weekend here at White Pond, Dan Newbanks and Chris Corley are joining us. And Chris, you look like you're busy doing something. What in the world is that? That must be 
Oh, uh, that's some Pete right there. Yeah, I was going to say that is the YDB <laughs> beverage of the weekend. I think that's Lafroig. I've had this before. I could tell you some stories about my experience with that, but it is a good way to round up an archaeological weekend, isn't it? Oh, it's so good. So smoky. Yeah, <laughs> smoky indeed. I mean, again, I'm reminded of the Wendover bog and, and similar experiences from the ancient world where we find wonderful cultural treasures from the ancient past that happen to uh, involve peat, like scotch. Yeah, so it's kind of a favorite of ours. Now, you guys are both, well, actually, you're an avocationalist, Chris, and Dan, you, you just completed your BA in anthropology, and so you, you guys both come at this, I think, from the same perspective in terms of, you know, you, you have a passion for archaeology and anthropology and learning about the world, and you both also have this in common. You're listeners of this podcast, so... This is maybe the first time we've sat down with a couple of listeners who are also doing work on your own ride. And, you know, first of all, welcome. And also, it's really great to see you here because you guys were also volunteering on the dig site earlier today. Yeah, so this is, um, this is my first uh, professional dig I was able to contribute to. And, and I will say that the reason why I'm here is because of this podcast. So, uh, you know, you guys were basically the catalyst to hook me up with, with more and have a volunteer opportunity. So it's really, really cool to, to be able to come out here and contribute and, and see the, the, the work in a professional setting. It's awesome to be able to be a part of that. Yeah. And it's not just anthropology and archeology. span I know Dan, you and I've talked for like 18 hours now, I think (laughs) we obviously have a lot of things in common beyond that. Yeah. And it's the same for me, actually, if it weren't for you guys connecting us to the professionals, I wouldn't have known about this this site even happening. I wouldn't have known about the research being done here. And uh, so kudos to you guys for, for doing exactly what you set out to do to, to bridge the gap. Yeah, appreciate that. Well, you know, again, we have a, a rare opportunity. And for the very first time, like we said, Seven Ages sitting down with, with listeners of the show. And so we want to take this opportunity to get a little bit of feedback for the other people who may be listening to the show. And, uh, you know, we've had 22 episodes out at this point when this is uh, being recorded here today. And, uh, you know, as you guys are going through the catalog and listening to the shows, uh, you know, we certainly hope that it is something that uh, is meaningful to you, which, you know, we believe it is since you've expressed that to you, or to us rather. But uh, ultimately, our goal is to connect people who are interested in this topic, uh, the amateurs, the professionals, everybody coming together like we've done here at White Pond today. So, um, you know, what I want to do is first start with you. Uh, Dan, what has been your experience here today at White Pond, and what has it meant for you to be part of this dig? Yeah, I I was actually really shocked. First of all, I I sort of put a a foot forward myself after hearing you guys uh, in your interview with Dr. Moore. Um, I guess it was last year where he was was saying how um, beneficial it was to have volunteers on site. And so I said, well, if he really wants volunteers, I'll be happy to help. And I you know, kind of set out to come find it. I sent a message to Dr. Moore on Facebook and said, hey, I'm coming, well, like it or not. So so I came up, and I was actually amazed at how um, you know, just humble and willing to teach Dr. Moore was. I mean, as, as illustrious as his career is and how just mind-blowing his research is and groundbreaking, he's still very willing to, to just kind of step down and help us understand what he's doing and why yeah he's so gracious with his time and we learn so much being out there in the field with him again what's so significant i think about this weekend is so we're all out here volunteers on this dig site and dr chris moore leading things off and while we're here i literally think it was on uh, march 13th that his most recent paper he's contributed to is published in scientific reports and so you know, here we're, we're seeing new evidence peer-reviewed forthcoming while we're out here doing work in the field. And I mean, it, it's really kind of a humbling experience to know that we're out here with the people who are leading, I think, on the leading edge of archaeology, geoarchaeology, anthropology, geology, you know, climatology in the ancient world. All these aspects of what we're studying, you know, we're, we're kind of on the cusp of this and with people who are kind of on the leading edge. And that is a truly, you know, a remarkable experience in itself, apart from what you learn in the moment while you're here you know there's also that backbreaking aspect of it you know chris corley you've been out here i think you probably put in more hours on the actual dig site than probably any of us out there lifting the shovel you know working the sand you know there's the blood sweat and tears aspect of it too but do you enjoy that i know you're a firefighter by profession right yes sir and you know I, i'm budding in the in this in the science and uh what i can't contribute 
I can contribute uh, in my back, you know. So uh, <laughs> that, I, I feel, uh, you know, very humbled and, and also inspired to be able to come out here and, and, you know, throw some dirt around because there's a lot that I don't know. And uh, I really appreciate the professionals that, you know, even listening to your guys' show and, and listening to um, and Dr. Moore talk. And I'm like, you know, coming out here and, you know, kind of intimidated to volunteer. And like, oh, God, I don't, I don't know. I've never been here. I don't know what I'm going to look like an idiot. Well, I've got to pay this guy a compliment, though, because, you know, when we all had lunch up there after our uh, talk that we gave at the uh, conference in Columbia last month, you know, Chris joined us there. You were at the conference. And at lunch, you were showing us you know, some of what you do as an avocationalist and the avocationalist role, again, the role of the dedicated amateur is so important in everything that we do, but you're showing us the way that you are collecting data. You're utilizing, I mean, all kinds of different systems that include, you know, Google earth and all kinds of analytics data to, to process information that you find in the field and to interpret and to present again, an accumulation of data that shows us lithic dispersals in the areas that you're working in the waterways. You again, a hobby diver like we are, right, right, right. and you're, you're obtaining a lot of data. That's really important. And bringing that back that the archeologists that work with the state and the universities here in South Carolina find very useful. Yeah. So, um, I'm a fourth generation collector and, mm-hmm. and when I first started, you know, looking for arrowheads or, you know, I didn't know it's cool. This is a cool looking arrowhead. And then, you know, there's always that question in the back of your mind. You're like, uh, the, the who, the what, the why, the where, and it leads down this rabbit hole of, of research and it kind of blooms into, uh, you know, more information, more knowledge that, that you can get. And what we're seeing here between the two of you is a passion and a love for the archaeology, for the history and the anthropology. So, Dan, I want to bounce over to you for a minute because you've had a life where you were going down one path and now you've ended up here with a degree in anthropology. So how did you get to here from where you were going originally? I don't think we have enough time to (laughs) rehash the whole thing. The the notes version. Yeah, but... uh, yeah, I think I've gone down several paths trying to reinvent myself over the years. Um, you know, it, funny thing about me and my life, the way I've lived it, is that I always find myself in industries that, uh, you know, were great five years ago. And I always find myself in that industry at the time they're collapsing. So, you know, with my luck, I'll get into archaeology and a comet will hit the earth or something, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it wouldn't be the first time, right? So I was in mortgage, <laughs> right? Exactly. So I was in mortgage, uh, you know, I did great in mortgage. I loved it. And then two years later, we had the, the big collapse in 2008, and the, there went the housing market. You know, uh, that did marketing. I got into Yellow Pages about the time Google came out. So right. <laughs> there, and now, now I'm just waiting for the next, uh, the next one. I get into insurance right about the time, uh, you know, uh, self driving cars are coming about. Right. But here you are, and you've just recently finished your anthropology degree, and uh, you have kept that love, you've kept that passion for history and archaeology, and so I commend you for sticking with it and making that great accomplishment in addition to your life. Uh, you know, I have the credentials and the knowledge to move forward in this field, and, and that's vitally important, I think. Yeah, so I mean, for the avocationalists who are out there working in the field like you, Chris, and then of course, you know, Dan, like you, who are taking it to the next level, and you know, you're you're going and you're furthering your study and you're contributing to the academic side of things. Again, that's part of what we try to do. I think, you know, Team Seven A, we want to bridge the gap and get avocationalists involved, and you know, have communication, or actually, I think the word of the weekend, interdigitation between <laughs> the avocationalists and the experts. So we commend you two, and I want to thank you guys for sitting down with us for a minute here on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you guys are great, and I'm sure we'll be hearing some more from you, and we're probably going to have to tap you and get you to help us in the field, so we'll be working some more together. Awesome. Thank you. So our last interview of the night is with a guy that's a real professional, works super hard out on the site, and you know I think of him kind of as an archaeological gunslinger, if there ever was one. He's a man after my own heart, tells it like it is, the one and only Chris Young. It's like a weird mix between cultural resource management and an Allman Brothers concert. Chris Young, (laughs) my man, University of South Carolina, archaeologist extraordinaire. When you first showed up on the site, Mm -hmm. I mean, let me describe, let me put this in the minds of the listeners. Chris comes walking down the path, the long beard, the long hair, you know, it's, it's kind of a mix again between sort of like, you know, Greg Allman and Gandalf. <laughs> and, and I've been called worse. That's all right. I've been called worse. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but then we're out there and then this guy is schooling all of us yeah. on the archaeological process. He's schooling us on just about everything. In fact, you know, we're trying to keep up in pace with this young man because it's been a long week. 
on the White Pond Dig, and he has been hard at work. Chris, how did you get into archaeology, my man? Um, so White Pond is like five miles north of Camden. Mm-hmm. Um, Camden, South Carolina is my hometown. Um, and so I've always grown up with the Indian mounds and the Mississippi culture and that kind of stuff in Camden. And actually, when my uncle died in 2014, I got a, I got a cigar box full of Arrowheads. Yeah. And what, there's a Clovis point in there. You're kidding. Really? Nah, nah, yeah. Nah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Nice. Did you know um, what that was when you when you found it, or did you um, learn? After no, I, I when I yeah, I was already you know going to school in New Mexico, working at, at Blackwater Draw, and um, came back here, and my uncle died, and I get a Clovis point. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> so you happened onto a Clovis point after working at the type site for yeah. the Clovis culture. Yeah. Unreal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's meant to be. You, you realize yeah, that, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sign. It's, it's, yeah. Something's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, you, huh. so you pursued archaeology professionally, and you primarily do CRM now, right? Yeah. I mean, I travel. I mean, like, before I got into here, I was at Hale Gold Mine in Kershaw County, but I was in Cape Canaveral, um, Florida, mm-hmm. um, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been good. It's been good. It's a lot of, you know, get an oil change every month instead of every Three, four yeah. months. Oh, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. I've been that guy. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, let's get honest here. I get the distinct impression, Chris, that you have a lot of knowledge and you have a lot of stories from the road. You probably have a lot of stories from different sites. But take us back for a minute to Blackwater Draw. Now, not just anybody in the world of archaeology can claim that they've worked at that particular location. So tell us a little bit about your experiences at Blackwater Draw. Um, For me, it was... You know, it's like if you're interested in early stuff, that's where you go. It's like, it's like the mecca, mecca, <laughs> mecca, paleo yeah. Indian, you know, archaeology. Yeah. If you want to go, but I was more interested in stone tools and lithics, and um, that's why I went out there. I wanted to see how those guys are fluting points. Yeah, and where, why are they there though? And it's kind of like why they're here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a natural pond. Mm-hmm. You have fresh water. Um, so it's a great site to be looking for Paleo Indians. I mean, both at Blackwater Draw, even though it's, it's dry now, you know, back in the day, it, there was, it was wet. Yeah, that's what they think. Yeah. Um, the, the out, mm. so I, I did a lot of work on the South Outlet Channel. Um, a friend of mine was working on a thesis, and we're trying to figure it out. Um, but it's like here, you got a freshwater pond. This, it's like shooting ducks on a pond. It's just, yeah, it, right. It, yeah. Yeah, and the, pond, and the pond's been here for 30,000 years. Exactly. Yeah, slam I mean, dunk, you know? Yeah, yeah. If I want to go where things are that I need, that's where I'm, I'm going to go. I yeah, mean. Yeah. yeah. And you have the freedom to do so, which is very unique in a career. Um, yeah. For the I most mean, part. I can take time off or I can go, I can go make some money. It's, it's, yeah. it's right. Yeah, yeah. How, how often do you work on archaeological sites here in South Carolina? Is it just us, South Carolina uh, or do you travel around? Um. South Asian, yeah, but gotcha. I did. Yeah. I have done some work in, in Ohio and we're at New Ohio. Mexico, um, yeah, if you can say um, North Canton. Okay, so wow. that's like Northwest Ohio, all the way to that's the whole. It, it was the whole state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was the whole from west to east, the whole state. And, and I guess what you're saying is that they they were installing a new pipeline, like a natural gas type pipeline. Yeah, but the thing about it up there is the glacial till. Yeah. Is what people don't understand. It's just Explain scoured. what that is for people who don't know. What is glacial till? Um, glacial till is what's roughed over after these. We have glaciers, and so you, they push down boulders and rocks and all this other stuff, and that's what's left. We're talking yeah. about that at the end of the Ice Age. Well, it, yeah, in, at the end of the Ice Age, but, I mean, what about the Little Ice Age? You know? We'll talk about that for a minute, actually. Oh, we're getting into stuff I don't want to look at. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's fine. But, but again, the periodicity of glacial and interglacial periods and the movement, again, of everything from stone to earth that occurs. I mean, there's a lot that we're trying to decipher, and that does take us all the way back to the Paleo-Indian period, which is part mm-hmm. of what's so damned interesting about all this. Right, right. You know, that we're digging, you know, four or five feet down in a hole, you know, 24 meters that way. Mm-hmm. And we're looking at all these processes as they occurred here over the last several thousands of years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, that 
plays an, a key and integral part of understanding, you know, paleo life and all the things that we study here today. And one of the reasons that we're at this site, but you know, Chris, a lot of times we talk to tenured professors, we talk to PhDs, we talk to people working in academia. It's not every day that we get to sit down with a seasoned CRM archaeologist. So I want to take an opportunity here to talk about that side of it, the CRM side of it. So give us a snapshot of what a typical, say, three month period of your life looks like. Oh man, it's like <laughs> being on the road with the Grateful Dead, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's like being on, it's like being on Dead Tour. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding you, man. I live in the back of my truck or whatever hotel um, the next project's at. Yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding. You. It's it's project to project. Um, it could be for a week, and it could be for six weeks. Yeah. Um, and it could be for wage determination, or it could be for whatever the CRM company is going to pay you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know and you just deal. You're I mean, hired because, gun. <laughs> well, but I mean, you're in it to do the work and to mm-hmm. be to, to do the science, or you're not. Right. You know, and that it's and you can tell this. You can you can figure out who's in it to do the science and who's in it to be Indiana Jones. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> right. you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny. I mean, because like this is all we get this week. This is a, this. Is a, how am I supposed to eat like this? You know. Well, you know. You grill out, you buy a double burner stove, yeah, and you get Chef Boyard D, and you show up the next day, and you f- the goals. <laughs> See, that, is, that, is, that is extremely you interesting. Know, I mean, I mean, but, but see, that's the whole thing. I mean, the lifestyle. Uh, you know, it, there are certain demands on individuals. You know, w- with this kind of work, and it's not easy. It's certainly not comfortable for a lot of people, you know, hmm. sleeping on a cot. And that's luxury right there. A lot of the time you're sleeping on a lot less than that. You're sleeping right here in the actual cabin, by the way. I mean, not right now, obviously. But, mm-hmm. I mean, you are, you are actually staying right here in the hunting lodge mm-hmm. in White Bond, right? Well, I'm, no, I'm sleeping in the back of my truck over here to the east. Even side. better. <laughs> See, point in case, ladies and gentlemen. Grid gents. east, grid east. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, I mean, it's kind of a tough way to make a living, you know. So, so why do you do it? I like it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I used to be an archaeologist, I mean, a land surveyor before I started doing this. So I've known being in the woods. And then, like I was telling you earlier, growing up five miles down the road, and if this is where DeSoto comes through here and sees, thinks this is where Kofa de Chucky is in 1540, but, you know, find a Clovis point. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's a great place to be right because – where it lies geologically on the fall line mm-hmm. in the coastal plain. You, you're right here. I've done work at Hale Gold Mine. I've had shovel tests that go to 80 centimeters, and the next one will go to 30. Mm. Wow. It, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Chris, how long have you been a CRM archaeologist? 12 years. 12 years. All right. So that lifestyle and everything that you've just described, I can only imagine – you know, the stories from the road, if you will, if you have some oh, of those. Oh, man. Yeah, without, 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 getting, uh, without getting too far into that, because I know the details could probably be a little more than we're allowed to put on this podcast. But uh, let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Working on a site, have you ever been part of a discovery that you just, it means something to you personally so much that it was profound for you? One that you just kind of always remember that sticks out in your mind. Mm-hmm. There was, um, so I'm going to have to be careful. Yeah. Barrier Island off the coast of Georgia. Okay. Um, that was cool. She was flexed. She, based on what the forensic, in the field forensic anthropology said, um, it's, she was probably 26. Um, but the bear claw necklace around her, I, she, I was the one getting the bones out, and there somebody else was screening. So mm. I didn't get to see it all. Right. Um, but that had a, that had a profound effect on me. I mean, that was, but I mean, it's like, I've done a lot of work in Cherokee Mm -hmm. on the call of boundary. So Mm -hmm. it's respectful to me. It's not, it's not my stuff. You know, that's, I understand. It it, it belongs to somebody else. It's somebody else's culture. It's not mine. Yeah. Yeah. The, one of the best quotes I ever heard from this guy that he's been doing, he's been doing archeology span for a long time. He's like, what's the coolest thing you ever found, Joel? The maps. Yeah. So when you take it all back and you map it all out and you see how it all lays out, that's the cool <laughs> shit. It's not, it's not the personal one pot shirt or this or whatever it is. 
is how it, how does this lay out? Then yeah. how's it? Yeah. But then what does it mean anthropo- anthropologically? And then take it a step. Who's it really mean? What does it really mean? Who? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Like the, I had this one professor who gives a shit. You know, (laughs) what's the whole picture? And I like that actually. And and, you know, and I I describe myself. We talked about this uh, when we were talking to Chris Cottrell. But I I consider myself to be kind of a generalist. And what that means to me is I'm a kind of a big picture guy. And the points, you know, you find these points and stuff, and it's pretty cool when you find them. But I'm interested in the in the in the whole. Right? Why are they here? Why why Why? are they here? Why 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 here? Why are they here? Um, It's like. You know, they they want to start picking points or flakes up out of the floor. I want to see the pattern. Yeah, yeah. I want to see. Yeah, pin flag it, leave him in in C two. Tart. Um, he's he's got a unit over in way way in yeah. the deep yeah. dark woods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we happen to have seen that by the yeah. way. We, we yeah. did. We but did he, see it. But yeah. what he did is he he brought in the concentration. If you take out one flake, then if you take out two flakes, then if you take out three flakes, the concentration is tighter. So. It, it does mean something. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it always tells a story. What you're looking at when you see that flake dispersal right there on that boundary is, okay, there was a guy sitting here, flint napping, before he went on a hunting trip down here next to this pond, or maybe went spear fishing for all we know. And the detective work, you know, Chris, the detective but work. But how do you know it's not on the teaching site? How do you know he doesn't have his son or his daughter yeah. there? Yeah. Uh, right. how, do you, how, do you know, how do you even know it's not a female Right. Yeah. Right. right. That's so it. now we're yeah. getting into gender. Yeah. Yeah. Those, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's be real. You know, I mean, let's be real about it. What do we know? We, I mean, we don't. Yeah, we're we guessing. Don't. We're, we're yeah, trying we're to guessing. make educated guesses here. And you know what, Chris? You may not remember this, but last year when we were here at this site with you, we actually talked about that. And we talked about the role of the female and what was the role. Because these are things that we just yeah. guess about and we talk about and we sit around a table like this and we wonder. So, and, especially if it's pre pottery. Yeah, you know, if, exactly. Yeah. If it's pre ceramic, you know, then okay, then are generalized, genderized. Yes. Speculation yes. of how women are today is what they would be yeah. doing. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. You got to take that bias out of it. Yeah, you got to take you got to take your personal filters off of it and just right. try to see yeah, yeah. it for, yeah. for what it is. And there's a lot of times where you know some of the things that we look at, some of the artifacts. I mean, and this is just like a feeling that I get, but. I see, uh, I see the female hand, in, you know, in a, a lot of the stuff because it's so, f- you know, some of the stuff is so fine and so well done, and there's so much detail that I you know. you're post processual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, if we get into the post processual no, archaeology, come on now, let's no. go going all yeah, yeah. But I, I see, I love that. Again, the different stages. I feel like we're almost on the cusp of another paradigm shift. I Arkell. think so too, man. I mean, I think we're on a, a paradigm shift because I think there's a lot more people who are PhDs doing CRM. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's and that makes a big difference right now because it wasn't like that years ago. All the PhDs went to the universities, mm-hmm. and it, if you had a master's level. But that gets back into the market being flooded with just PhDs who kids get a four year degree from let's say like Carolina. Yeah. And immediately go to graduate school without having any field experience. And that kinda of hurt the field. Yeah. And it kinda of pissed a lot of us off, yeah. to be honest with you. Um and it's kinda of helped the field though in a retrospect, in a kind of mm. a, a backdoor kind of kind of way. Yeah. If you can't lean a f-ing one by two, get the f- out. Ah, <laughs> I'll add this. I'll add this yeah. too. I mean, in terms of the post processual archaeology, you know, that's kind of defined by CRM, I think. And now we're seeing this very data driven kind of archaeology where we're incorporating LIDAR, we're co- incorporating more of the blood protein analysis, we're incorporating so much that we haven't seen in, in decades past. And that's why I think that, again, what you're saying, you know, what's the most important thing you derive from this site? I see that map. I see the data points. I see the information. And all of a sudden, I get a like a shift in perspective about all this. And that is kind of what we're looking at. We're, we're heading into a new era, I think, with archaeology in regard to where the information, where the technology is taken. But how you assimilate the information. I mean, Good question. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. it's, it's like I can remember 10 years ago when PXRF was the shit. You know what I mean? But yeah. nobody knew how to de- deal with the data. Yeah. But we got this gun it's gonna tell us what got right. as far as trace elements and for rare earth elements and all this kind of thing all right great you got all this data 
What does it mean? Nope, not not, even that. What does it mean? Do you know how to read it? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so it's it's that kind of stuff. And (laughs) archaeology is real quick trying to cop on to the next new buzz. But Yeah, and you know what, Chris? These technologies, they come and they go, and some we can use, and some pan out ultimately not to be everything that they were hyped to be, but... Uh, as we're wrapping up here, I want to kind of stop for a minute and go back to the beginning of the conversation. Now, you're a CRM archaeologist, mm-hmm. and you are willing to drive all over the nation to different sites and put in the hard work and the surveying that you're doing here at this site, uh, and you're sleeping in the back of your truck. What is it about this yeah. that you love so much that you're willing to do that? It's like a crossword puzzle, man. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. That's yeah. the one thing I like about pipeline CRM projects. I get the crossword puzzle it, because it fits the puzzle, yeah. you know. So I was here last year. Hmm. You know, we got some unanswered questions. Let's come back this year and answer those questions. And then, damn, we look at some of these units that we have, and I'll be back next year to answer some of those questions. Yeah. And then, yeah. You know, it's, it's so for you. It's about the story. Oh yeah, man! And yeah. Story of my home. That's right. That's what. Yeah. That's right, brother. And as a fellow South that, Carolinian, yeah. I understand. Kershaw County, man. That's I right. Hell yeah! I understand you, brother. I'm from Charleston. Cool but. 102. Dude, shout out. <laughs> oh, gosh, cool man. I tell you, it's, a, it's always so much fun catching up with you, Chris Young. Thank you for sitting down with hey, the man, Seven Ages. Thank y'all for yeah. having me. Cheers, yeah. to cheers, you, sir. brother. Yeah, Happy St. Patrick's yeah. Day. Yeah. yeah, you too, brother. Chris Young, a legend indeed, a legend in his own right, a legend that has lived in the back of many a pickup truck and has dug more dirt probably than we have ever seen. What a guy. And I tell you, like you said, James, he knows archaeology as good as anybody. We'll be out there in the field and every now and then when we're out there doing work, trying to, you know, trying to do what we can to help, you know, you'll you'll feel his presence. He'll come up and he'll kind of keep an eye on things. He always has a grasp of everything that's going on. You know, he sees the entire archaeological site as a system, you know, as a machine. And he is definitely one of those cogs in that machine. And I'll never forget the first time that he came out there. You know, there's this fellow, and I figured he was a volunteer. Little did we know this guy. I mean, he'd studied out there in New Mexico, and he had worked with some of the greatest at some of the most amazing sites. Again, the Clovis type site. He's had the kind of experiences that archaeologists hope in their careers they get to have. And again, just a wonderful person. One of the many that we've been able to meet uh, over the course of the last few years working with Southeastern archaeologists. And we're so proud, again, to be able to bring these folks to the table here at the Crosstime Pub and share these experiences with the listeners. So, fellas, that wraps up quite a marathon there, doesn't it? Yeah. While we've had the uh, marathon of Chris's tonight, I've had time to think of the outline for a couple of new drinking games for the cross time pub. Uh-oh. And it all revolves around the five Chris's. Okay. Right, so Do you we- can't name the five Chris's. You got to take a drink. Oh, <laughs> you can name the five Chris's. You got to take two drinks. Well, I'm working out the rest of the details, but it sounds like a good time. I'm eager to hear how this all goes down. Yeah. yeah I think we're up to a good start there. Yeah. And you know which Chris I'm thinking of. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, w- there's more Chris's out there because we recently had a letter from one, and I know that there's more in the listening audience. And speaking of the listening audience, there's a few things that all of you can do to help us out. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Don't forget at sevenages.org is where you can find all of our articles, links to everything that we do, including our donate button that we would greatly appreciate as we get ready for more excavations coming up, more field schools that we need to attend. Uh, donations would be most helpful indeed. And don't forget to rate and review the show. That's how we're able to grow the show and get more listeners, more people involved and get you more guests and bring you more fantastic content like we had right here tonight. Absolutely. And of course, we always like to hear from you too. If you would like to send an email to one of us, Jason, James, or Micah, just use our name at sevenages.org. That is the email. And of course, you can interact with us on social media. But I see a certain bartenderess over there that I would like to interact with because I think it's about time to refill our glasses and call it a night. So Jason Pentrail, James Waldo, I am, of course, Micah Hanks. Thanks to all you guys out there who have tagged along on our recent adventures. We hope to see you on a few more yet to come. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. 